for our first keynote session, I'm pleased to lead back-to-back -back conversations with the major party candidates for the mighty office of Texas Lieutenant Governor. State Senator Dan Patrick, Republican of Houston, and State Senator Leticia Van De Pute, Democrat of San Antonio. I'll introduce Senator Van De Pute shortly, but first let me say a few words about Senator Patrick, who won his party's nomination by taking the top spot in a four-way primary in March and winning the May runoff against the second place finisher, incumbent David Dewhurst, with more than 65% of the vote. He was first elected to represent Senate District 7 in 2006 and has twice been reelected. In the 83rd legislative session, he chaired the Senate Committee on Public Education, served on the Criminal Justice, Finance, Health and Human Services, and Intergovernmental Relations Committees. Chairman Patrick, who up until this point has been best known as a radio talk show host, grew up in East Baltimore and earned his undergraduate degree from the University of Maryland, Baltimore. Please join me in welcoming Senator Dan Patrick. Appreciate you being here. Great to be here. Good to Evan. see you. Oops. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. For a guy who is allegedly missing in action, you're here in the flesh. Yeah. There you are. I am here. Let me ask you about that charge. It was leveled by the Houston Chronicle editorial board in the last day, and it's been leveled by your opponents that you've been running an invisible campaign. One debate, very few press availabilities, although you had a press conference yesterday. It was on one topic, business, so you yes. took questions only on business, and no specific policy papers from you. Senator Van de Pute has released them. General Abbott, Senator Davis. They say you're hiding out. And again, I'm going to quote the editorial page of the Houston Chronicle. We can only conclude that he's scared, scared of his fellow Texans and his opponent, scared of that unbridled tongue of his. Would you care to respond to that? Sure. Uh, I don't have an unbridled tongue. Number two. Uh, you don't I, seem very bridled to me. but uh, uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I'd have to look at the exact dates. I think I've been on the road. 30 of the last 40 days, yeah. Thursday, for example, uh, I was hiding in Lubbock, apparently, as I spoke to the Chamber of Commerce, then I went to Texas Tech to speak to educators, and then I went to speak to cotton farmers. Uh, I've been everywhere. I've been in the Valley. I think we've made three or four trips. I've been in El Paso. Yeah. I've been talking to uh, leaders all across the state. Uh, the Houston Chronicle just has it wrong. Uh, I think by last count, I've had over 1,300 plus meetings with individuals and groups around the state. So the idea that you're trying to run the clock out without making a mistake that would cost you this election. It's ridiculous. Not, 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 not true. It's ri now, yeah. I, you know, I think, and the, I also think that, you know, the Chronicle's biggest charge is I didn't sit down with their editorial board, and uh, that is correct. Uh, my focus is on visiting with the people. I've been in this campaign now, Evan, for, um, for more than a, well more than a year, yeah. nonstop. Uh, I've had two grandchildren born during uh, the campaign. I've barely seen them. Uh, my wife is on this trip, uh, so we can see each other. So yeah. the idea that I'm hiding is, is just it's absolutely not, 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 right there. Just not true. Let's use the time we have mostly to talk about the issues. Because and I'm always happy to be with you, by well, the way. Oh, I'm touched by that. Um, well, we've done this we a have, lot. We, we, have, have we, we, ha we have done this a lot. I have seen you in this context many times. Yeah, we, and, and in terms of debates, uh, you know, I've, I think that you're – you're on the cutting edge, Evan, of oh, what is needed in politics. I appreciate it. In, I do. No, no. In terms of, I think you're fair. I, I don't. I would. If my. If I made a bet, I wouldn't suggest you're a conservative Republican. But you've always treated me fairly. You ask tough questions, but fair questions, let, and those are good discussions. Let me get on with the tough questions. Yes. I mean, uh, um, so in the so Senator, in the absence yes. of in the absence of position papers, I'm going to use your website as the basis for the positions sure. that you are, are advocating in this campaign. Immigration. Yes, sir. Which has been, as anything, has been a central issue of your campaign, yes. both for the nomination and in the general. Correct or incorrect? End in-state tuition, correct? Yes. Sanctuary cities bill, come back up if you have something to say about it. Yes. Uh, Arizona-style ask-for-your-papers legislation. Uh, no, that's not a part of the, the plan. The, my main focus, Evan, is, and uh, as we've discussed, we've run a very disciplined campaign on key issues, right. uh, border security, and we were criticized, as you know, early in the campaign by a number of people, including right. my opponents, but we've been proven to be right. Well, the mountains come to Muhammad on that right. issue, right? And, Everybody's talking about it. And what I have been saying, folks, for a long time is, obviously, I'm not, the Republicans are not anti-immigrant, we're not anti-Hispanic, we're not anti-anyone. We are pro-law and order and border security. And I started laying out the facts last year when people would dispute those facts, and they've all been 
uh, turned out to be true. Except, et cetera, except you know that it is not necessarily what you've said, but what has been occasionally criticized is the way you've said it. You had the chair of the McAllen Chamber of Commerce, or the CEO of the McAllen Chamber of right. Commerce, last week say that you and other Republicans talking about immigration has actually cost the economy of the valley. You know that. Yeah. I'm not going to get 100% of the vote or 100% of support, and there are some people who will, who will be against no matter what I right. say and try to put it in their terms. But I've had over, I guess, 30-some forums and debates during the primary. I'm the only candidate who's had the triple crown of uh, elections. I've had a tough primary, tough runoff, and I have a very smart and very likable opponent. Uh, I know Letitia very well. Yep. We sit behind each other or next to each other on the Senate floor, and I consider her a friend, actually. We just totally disagree on most issues. You're, 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 not, you're not taking the race for granted. That's, that's, absolutely that, yeah. not. I'm, right. And that's why I'm working so hard. But let's get back to the immigration come, come issue. Back, come back to the question of whether the rhetoric of this campaign, yours or anybody else's, is affecting the party's ability to attract Latinos yeah. and hurting the valley. Now, let me tell you what I think is, is going to impact the Democrats from attracting Latinos, and that's taking a pro-abortion position for a community that is very pro-life. Uh, taking a position against school choice for a community that wants school choice for students, their children, and failing schools. The immigration issue, I have not, uh, you know, if my opponent or, or the media wants to say I've used a word or two that they don't like, and I, I'll just accept the criticism and disagree but move forward. Right. But here's the focus. We have a real and present threat from ISIS, Al-Qaeda, uh, the drug cartels, and anyone who laughs in the audience at that um, is being very naive about the real problem. We just had in Australia this week 15 ISIS um, uh, sympathizers arrested because they were going to go through the streets of either Sydney or Brisbane and randomly cut off the heads of people. Make no mistake, folks, that we know without releasing uh, classified information but what has been leaked to the press or reported, we have apprehended people over the last several years from Syria and Pakistan and Somalia. We have great concerns about ISIS or terrorists coming to this country. And make no mistake, our border is still wide open. We're doing a better job than we've done in the past, but it's a real threat. Well, but let, and let, my let, number yeah, one yeah. responsibility, yeah. Evan, is to protect the public. That's every elected official's responsibility, Republican or Democrat, is to protect your lives. And so we have to do everything we can to keep you safe. And let me just add to this last statistic. And I said this on the campaign trail, and people didn't listen but I was proven to be right. From 2008 to 2012, four years, we arrested 143,000 people in the state of Texas, put in our jails, who we then discovered were here illegally. Not people coming here for a job, people coming here to make crimes, commit crime. We charged them, Evan, with 447,000 crimes. We charged them with over 5,000 rapes and 2,000 murders. Department of Public Safety estimates we have 100,000 gang members here Ill illegally. That's a real issue. I'm for immigration reform. I support a guest worker program. Washington, I blame both Republicans and Democrats. They need to act on this issue. Because well, the second part of this, this, yeah. this issue, Evan, is that we should not be a country that says you have to come to America, to America by swimming across a river or in the back of a 18-wheeler and suffocate. We pick up hundreds of bodies every year on Texas land of children, women, and seniors who die when they're dropped off by the drug cartels. We must have legal immigration reform in Washington, but until that comes, we must secure the border to protect Texans from terrorists and criminals who come here. Uh, uh, I'm going to jump in. So we, we only that's have, just we only the reality. Have, we only have 30 minutes. I, wanna, I, mean, I appreciate you offering well, your it's, point of view. It's, it's a very important issue. I understand that. Uh, education. You, at the uh, beginning of the 2013 session, yes. introduced what some people said was a, a, a plan to have vouchers. You took issue with the characterization of that at that time, but you did push for a broadly defined school choice. Yeah. Are you satisfied with what passed last session, and will you come back if you return as lieutenant governor and try to put either a voucher program as far as it goes or some expanded school choice into effect? Well, first of all, I was honored to be chair of education last session, and I think most people would agree. I think my opponent voted on virtually every bill we passed out of the committee, and I appreciated her support. We worked together on those issues. But House Bill 5 was a sweeping bill that reformed education to put more focus on career and not just college. We want every child to have an opportunity to go to college, but every one of our 5.1 million students in our traditional schools, we have 300,000 homeschool, 250,000 in private, about 150,000 in charters, not every child wants or needs or feels they need to go to college. 
And so we, we expanded our, our high school graduation plan to put more focus on career, and we passed a charter bill. And by the way, that bill that Jimmy Don Acock, the chairman of the House, and myself wrote together, it reduced standardized testing from 15 to 5. And by the way, that bill passed 181 to nothing. So I think I demonstrated that I can listen, lead on the key, will, will, on a key will issue. You, will you come back around on choice again? Yeah, let's talk about choice. Um, I'm sure in this room there are some uh, pretty great stories that we could hear where you pulled yourself up by your own bootstraps or that you're the first child in your family to graduate from college. But I would also say that many people in this room have uh, lived a, a life of great opportunity and there was no question from your family or yourself that you were going to go to college one day. The truth is that that's not the case for every citizen. We already have school choice. Let's, let's be honest about it. If you're rich enough, your parents send you to private school. And if you're mobile enough, that means your parents can move to the suburbs, you move to the suburbs. We don't have white flight from our cities, we have school flight. And in our inner cities, in Texas, we have a lot of failing schools, and we have a lot of parents who don't have the money to send their children to private school, and can't move to the suburbs because they depend on public transportation to go to work. So why should that, in many cases, a single mom, and over 90% of our students in the inner, inner city are black and brown, why should that parent, that mom, or that grandparent who's ever raising that child, why should they be denied of having a choice where to send their so, child? So what are you advocating for different from what is already the case after the last session? Well, first of all, uh, I would like to see, uh, and not every school district has open enrollment, I think you should have no child should be forced to go to a failing school. And uh, I'd have to go back and double check these numbers. Uh, somebody will correct me by two points in point of fact if I'm two schools off, I think. But um, uh, almost 10% of our schools, we rate in the state as failures. Can you imagine, those of you who are adults in here that have children or grandchildren, can you imagine agreeing to send your child to a school that the state says is a failure? You wouldn't put up with it. And so the first thing we need to do, and one of the bills that we had last session said, if your child is in a school that has had a failing record for two years and you're economically disadvantaged, then you have an option to go to another school of your choice. But that is currently the law, right? That, 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 did that not be get, get baked into the cake last time? No. So, so you're saying that you want that now, you're going to come back with that for, for the next Here's session. Here's what I want as lieutenant governor. Right. And I have a different role than being a senator. Right. As lieutenant governor, my goal is to secure the border and protect your lives. My goal is to reduce your property tax. Another well, I'll come issue. to that in a I second. Know, right, yeah. but, that, but that's my goal because yeah. people can't afford the increasing appraisal in their homes. They can't afford to have their taxes double. My job is to give school opportunities to every parent in the state of Texas. It's the job of the senators right. to decide the path we go to pass that legislation. So, so, then your, so then your definition, before we move on to taxes, your definition of choice in the next session will be? Uh, expanded choice within districts and the opportunity potentially to take your kid out of a public school district and put them someplace else. Yes, and we also had a bill that said we would allow businesses to put money in a fund. So the scholarship program. A scholarship fund. Right. So that if, here would be the first. You intend quick, to have that come back? Yes. Here, here, very quickly, here, here was kind of our model. Right. The, the, the first choice you should have is to go to any public school that you want all across the state. You could even cross district lines. They do that in many districts now but there's no reason why a student should be locked into a district. Secondly, and we looked into even yeah. uh, focusing on the transportation, but the next choice is you should have an opportunity to go to a charter school. We passed a bill, it was, it was Senate Bill 2 or 3, I forget the number that I passed. It took me three sessions to get it done, but it passed 30 to 1 in the Senate, so we got great support uh, that will expand charters and close down the bad ones. We've already closed down several since yeah. the last session. And then the third choice would be, if you can't find a public school to go to, if you can't find a charter school to go to, then you could apply, if you meet the certain requirements of being economically disadvantaged, you're in a yeah. failing school, you could get a, a scholarship from private business and take that money to go to a Catholic school, a Christian school, a private school, wherever you want to go. And that did the not, same, yeah. that did not that make That did not, it. but that might come back. No, that, yeah. we, look, my wife was a longtime school teacher. I, Public school is where the majority of our children, again, 5.1 out of 5.7 right. million students go to traditional public school. So we have to support our public schools. It's not always about the money, by the way. We have many schools that get less money in another school well, and outperform well, those you, schools. You've just held the door open to that part of this, which sure. I do and want I'm to get to, to as well. That. On, on yeah. the question of school finance, yeah. that has been a little bit of a flap in this case. 
August 28th press release from your campaign. I led the charge to restore most of the education cuts from last session. Senator Vandepute said, that's hooey, you voted against the budget. PolitiFact, you're obviously fond of right. PolitiFact, found with Senator Vandepute that it was absurd for you to say on the one hand, I supported restoring the cuts when you voted against the budget. Right. How do you defend that? By the way, PolitiFact sometimes gets it right. They, they, they did agree with me when I said there are more people crossing the border every week than are born in Texas. But so I want to. I want to know. How, but, but I want to well, ask were, you: How can yes. you say that you vo you you voted to restore, or that you supported restoring the cuts when you voted against well, the budget? And and uh, Senator Williams has come out and, and kind of clarified his statement from then, and and has said my opponent has used this. It's just a political statement. But um, I was chair of education. I serve on finance, so obviously I was instrumental in leading to replace some of the money that we cut during the 2009 session, and. So I did do that, and I voted for that out of the Senate. Uh, the bill came back from the House, and, and, and finance bills go through many stages, through many processes, um, through conference committee, and at the end of the day, the final budget was not a budget I felt I could support overall. It wasn't about the education cuts, it was about Actually, the Actually, in, in some ways it, it was, in some ways it was about border funding. It was a, a number right. of things. One of the issues I had with the budget, and, and I don't want to get too deep in the weeds and take the time up, but it's important to know. Too late. That's all right. <laughs> There was a supplemental bill, House Bill 1025, that was basically about a half a billion dollar giveaway to get Democrat support to vote for the budget. That's what it was. Are you going to put more money back into public education? I mean, yes or no? Will you be a supporter of putting more money back into public education next session, if you're elected lieutenant governor? Yes, but I want it to be spent wisely. The idea of just putting money in and saying, I have a school that's been in an inner right. city that's been a failure for years, and we're just going to give it more money and let them continue to do the same thing they've been doing? Not for it. I'm not, I'm, and I don't think anyone would be for that. We need, we need accountability, we need improvement, and we need money where we need to spend the money. You, I totally support that. You talked about cutting property taxes. That yes, has sir. been something you've banged on the whole time. Isn't there no statewide property tax? There is no statewide property tax. There is no tax. statewide property tax. So how can you as lieutenant governor, other than rhetorically, be an advocate for cutting property taxes. Oh, well, lots of ways. At the state it, level, you don't have the power to cut property taxes. Evan, don't, now I was not here in 2006. I, I, my first session was 2007. But in 2006, the state legislature imposed a 10% cap. Yeah. So All it's right? not so much about cutting, it may be about capping, or it may be about well, some other means of. Here's been the problem, right. here's been the problem with um, the, the whole property tax issue. You can cut your property taxes, but if you don't, address the appraisal issue, the value, all it does is wipe out any tax decrease you get. Now the rule of 72, everyone knows whatever you divide into 72 doubles over that time. So if the value of your home increases 8% a year on average, which it did roughly from 97 to 2007, then we had the downturn in 09, but now it's back up. And I know yeah. Austin is like Houston, Dallas, you're seeing 9, 10 above that in terms of your appraisal increases. But if your home average is 8% a year, in nine years your taxes double. So if you live in a $200,000 home today and you're paying roughly 6,000 in taxes, in nine years if it goes up eight or 9% a year, you now have a $400,000 home and a $12,000 So tax the idea would be, to, would be to cap the amount that it could go up. Well, there are many ways to do it. And yeah. again, I'm gonna, I'll, I have a little bit different, so I appreciate the Lieutenant Governor, I feel like he's been a good leader, yeah. but I'll have a little different style of leadership. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna, our senators, we have smart people in both parties. And I'm gonna, and by the way, property taxes are not a Republican issue. In fact, right. some of the people who are being squeezed the most are people who live in inner cities, who've lived, who've lived in neighborhoods their whole lives, and now someone comes in and buys a lot, knocks down the house and puts up a half a million dollar condo, and now the value of their land is greater than their house and they can't afford it. People in this room who make a good living might say, I don't like my property taxes going up, but I can afford to write the checks. People in the inner cities can't afford to write that check, and they're being forced out of their homes, and where do they go? So what yeah. we, there are many ways to approach it. Think of your property taxes a little bit like this, a seesaw. As the value goes up, your effective tax rate should go down to no more than population and inflation, three or 4% a year, and then give flexibilities to your counties and cities that they have their own budget issues, so that in the counties and cities, if they need more than population inflation, which is about what people are getting in their raises, if they're getting that much, then they can come to the people and say, look, we have a need, right. we need more money, and let the people vote on it. So, right now, you have taxation through evaluation, 
without representation. So the net net, Senator, if you, whatever method you use to whether cap appraisal or whatever else, the net net is going to be less money paid out by people for property tax. That's the goal. So they can Does, afford Don't to property taxes help to fund public schools? Well, they do. So uh, if you reduce property tax revenue, aren't you cutting funding for public education? Um, you know, when we were in 2000, <laughs> when we were in uh, 2009, and we've been criticized for cutting the funding to education, realize that our budget's made of, comprised of basically three areas. Public ed, higher ed, healthcare. Pu public ed, higher ed, healthcare, and public, and, and public safety. Public safety, right. It's about 90% of the whole budget. Right. And, and depending on how you want to look at the dollars for education, 37 to 40% of the total budget. So if you have a $20 billion shortfall, yeah. the, the biggest part of the budget is going to face a cut. The Republicans made a decision, and I think it was the right decision. It was better to take a little bit of money out of the school district's pocket than to take money out of your pocket when people were facing losing their jobs. And it's easy to look back now and say, well, we knew we were going to come out of this. And Texas has come out of it. Well, the fact is we didn't even really know how much money we had available to us until two years later. Right. And we didn't know how far the slide was going to be. And, right. the, you know, so, and the schools survived, and, and, and we did fine. But the, what I've always believed, and, and I've been talking about this for many years, yeah. is that we need to transition from depending all on property taxes uh, to more of a sales tax base. Uh, that recovers quickly, more people pay. But right. you understand that shifting from right. property to sales tax is itself a widely criticized uh, plan. For one thing, it's regressive. Um, if, if you take a penny or two, uh, and I think I've talked to some Democrats in the Senate who, who I think are open to this idea. If you take a penny or two, uh, I believe the numbers, and it's changed since the last right. time I looked, a penny's worth about two and a half billion. Again, I, I have to go back and double check the number. but. But would a person stop buying something because it cost them a dollar ten instead of a dollar eight? I'm just using that as an example. Yeah. So if a person paid, and the and the bills that we've talked about in the past would do two things, Evan. Um, first of all, it would exempt people at a certain level of poverty. They they would get right. a rebate back. So it would not be a tax on the poor. If you want to talk about a tax on the poor, let's get rid of the lottery. That's the but biggest. But I want to be sure, sure we Senator. In the time we don't have a lot of time, I want to be sure I understand yeah. this. Are you talking about a swap out of the sales tax for the property tax, replacing property tax revenue with sales yeah. tax revenue? I'm talking about bringing uh, senators together and House members, hopefully, right. and some of the best minds in the state, and and let's be honest about this tax policy. People cannot afford for their property taxes go up but 8 won't 10 the business community freak out if you increase the sales tax? Won't we lose a whole bunch of businesses no. that have been attracted to Texas by favorable conditions for them to be here? It's not increasing, it's a swap. Here's the question, Evan. Would you yeah. rather pay $2,000 or less in your property taxes and maybe $200 more in sales taxes? You come up, you come out $1,800 ahead. I don't, you know, it depends on the value of but your house. But the point is, this is something you're willing to entertain. Well, I think this is something we, right. we need to have a serious discussion about. Right. We're not going to have an income tax. Now, my opponent may have a different view on that. I do not support an income tax yeah. whatsoever, and I don't think the majority of Texans support an income tax. But there, there, and, and then if you look at commercial property, my goodness, do you know there's no cap on commercial property? So taxes on buildings and shopping centers are going up 20 or 30 percent a year. Uh, and, and where do you think, who pays that tax? You all pay it that tax. It gets passed on us. It gets passed we, on to us. We, we have 10 minutes. I have a couple of things I need to yes, ask sir. you before you dash off. You want to reduce property taxes. Why don't you fix health care? The fact is, in a lot of counties around the state, the uncompensated care costs are being passed on to regular folks in the form of higher property taxes. 5.7 million people in the state of Texas have no health insurance. Let's fix health care. What are you going to do about that? Well, and, and there, again, as I said, my opponent and I, I She's very smart, very likable. She'd be a great neighbor. We'd have a, we'd have a lot of great evenings sitting out on the porch discussing public policy. Um, but I don't agree with her. She wants to expand Obamacare. I do not. I want our money to come back in the terms of block grants to the state of Texas. This is a room of smart people. And however, if I gave you an assignment today to fix the health care system of North Carolina, I don't really think you're qualified to do it. And the people in Washington aren't qualified to fix the health problems and the insurance problems of Texas. That should be our focus. And but we, our but we've had a problem of having the most uninsured people and knowing the most for yes, 20 years. If we could fix the problem, we were so smart about Texas, why haven't we done it? Um, <laughs> we have, Evan, we have, our hands are tied in many ways. The federal government is too heavily involved. And again, send us our money. Send us our money and block grants. Let Texans decide right. how best to 
to structure so our health care system of the Obama and then hold us accountable. In the absence of the Obama administration dropping a cartoon bag of money with a dollar sign on it on the steps of the Capitol, so we're, then we're going to do nothing for the next two years? No, I, I, we, we need to continue. No, look, um, we need to continue to try to provide health care uh, to every Texan that we yep. can possibly provide it to. Um, we do have a situation where our hands are tied by the federal government in many right. ways. We've asked for waivers, we've asked for block grants, we've made some progress in those areas. But look, we have a lot of poor people who are moving to this state because they're being driven out of other states by Democrat policies that are killing jobs. In Texas, and, and um, in Texas, look, yesterday we held a press conference, virtually every business association, every business association uh, has endorsed our campaign, maybe 95%, there may be a few that haven't. Because of the clear, distinct record between myself and my opponent, on creating jobs and being and, pro-business. And again, quickly, your fear is that if we move in the wrong direction on health care, that will impact jobs. Yes, and one of the biggest right. things in health care, by the way, is tort reform. You can't find a person in Texas who is knowledgeable about business and medicine, yeah. who doesn't think tort reform was the most important bill we passed. I wasn't there when it passed. I supported it through my, through my media right. enterprise. My opponent, there are only four senators who voted against tort reform, and my opponent was one of those who voted against tort reform. If without tort reform, our health care would be even more expensive. I was at a restaurant last night, very quickly. Quick, we, have five, we have five minutes. I have a to go toll yes. road speed, not highway a, speed a for doctor, the last five minutes. A doctor came up to me last night, and we were having a discussion. He just moved here a year ago right. from Arizona. His malpractice insurance is Arizona. He's an OBGYN. with was 77000 a year. In Texas, it's 7000 a year for him. So that's, it's had a real effect it's on It's had a real in, uh, impact. And yeah. so when we look at medical cost, um, I think my opponent was just clearly wrong on tort reform. And I think if my opponent were lieutenant governor, you would see tort reform peeled back in the state. Um, equal pay, a topic that has come up in this yes. campaign. I'm going to read you back a quote of yours. Quote, women should be paid the same as a man, but I don't believe government should enforce it. True? Correct. I don't think Would you say the same about Latinos and blacks? I don't think government, Evan, should tell business how much you should pay your staff at the G Tribune. Uh, gender neutral, race neutral, Absolutely. no it, protection it should for be any based particular on performance. class. And if a woman does a better job than a man, she deserves to be paid more. Uh, and we have a lot of women business owners. I don't want the state of Texas telling women business owners, you have to pay, this, you have to pay everyone the same. Do you think we have an equal pay problem or is the press and our campaigns you're running against and, and democratic campaigns largely raising this issue overblowing it? Do we have a problem or don't we? You know, I, I don't think it's a problem, but, but to say, are there some businesses who yep. may not treat people fairly? Yes, but I don't think it's a problem. Right. And I think, look, I'm a small business guy. Uh, yep. I have a lot, I've always had a lot of women work for, for, for our company. Um, if, we did, if we did a run I of want your the best if we employees did a run I of your have. If we did a run of your salaries at your business senator, would we find that women were paid equally to men? In some cases, you'd find they were paid more. Um, so, look. I'm a business guy, and like every businessman and woman, you want the best people. You don't really care what color they are, where they come from, what gender they are. You want them to do the job. But you just don't want the government to have a role I don't in, want the in, government in, in to tell you. Yeah, let me, let me elect you for purposes of the last three minutes, Lieutenant Governor. Okay. Uh, the people who have supported you in this campaign are rock rib conservatives in the primary and so far in the general, correct? There are rock rib conservatives who are your base. Through the primary, yes, sir. Those sorts of folks are supporting Scott Turner in the speaker's race against Joe Strauss. Will you? Uh, I have no involvement in the speaker's race. Come on. No, Evan. You, I, you, you can no. very easily Evan. endorse Mr. Turner if you want to. Evan, look, um, you always ask tough questions and, and you're always very fair, but that's really not a, a, a real question. Why? I'm, uh, look, as, no, as Lieutenant Governor, that's the House decision. That's the House decision. So you're not going to speak out in one way or another as far as I, the speaker's race goes? I will work with Joe January. Strauss, Scott Turner. Are you comfortable with chamber. Joe Strauss? I'm comfortable with who's ever leading. That's the, that's, that's, that's Do you think Joe House Strauss number. is a sufficiently conservative speaker of the House? Uh, Evan, I'm not going to play this game with you. Well, it's, I, but, but, with respect, gonna, Senator, not, it's a yes or no question. You know, no, I answered the question already. I'm yeah. not getting involved in the House race, yeah. and I'm not going to let you get me involved in the House race. All right. I'm going to try, though. You know I know you're going to try. I still like you. All right, thanks. Um, like you. Good uh, try. How are you getting along with General Abbott these days? I haven't seen you campaigning very much together. He runs his campaign. I run my campaign. And by the way, uh, and we get along great. We have a great yeah. relationship. I was with him most of the day, you know, this week. Up in day. Lubbock? Up in Lubbock and, and here in Austin and, yeah. and different places. Um, obviously, 
uh, my opponent was supported in her campaign uh, by her core base, okay, right. uh, in a primary. I was supported. But now, this is why I had to laugh at the Chronicle article. I have spent very little time uh, reaching out to my base. I've probably done less than six events. Yeah. I've, been, I've been in the Valley again. I've been in El Paso. Right. I've been in, and we have more Hispanics, by the way, living in Houston and Dallas right. than we do Let in the Valley. Let me ask you to come back I've to been Abbott. Come okay. back to Abbott. Okay. So okay. You, you, you and Abbott get along well? Absolutely. You're in sync on everything? I don't know that we're in sync on everything. I haven't looked at every one of his policy right. positions. You know that Paul Burka of Texas Monthly wrote not long ago, you've heard of Paul Burka at Texas Monthly. Yeah, I've heard of Paul Burka. Uh, that uh, he thinks that the whole play here is that you're going to wait four years and then run against Abbott uh, uh, for governor. You know, I read a lot of stupid things, in, in the, and that's probably one of the dumbest things I've ever well, seen. Well, take it off the table right now. You can, make, you can make the whole thing go away that, by, by saying that you're pledging something. not to run against Greg Abbott in four years. Let me tell you something. Put it in cement, OK? I'm not, not running against it. Greg Abbott in at any years. point in time in four years or any time. Okay. That's just ridiculous. So not, not happening. Ridiculous. So we, we've dealt with the two leadership issues. Let me yes, deal with yes. one technical issue in the Senate before we yes, let sir. you go. You have advocated since the very beginning for reducing the two-thirds rule yes. in the Senate down to 60 percent. Yes, which Is would be right? 19. Which would be 19. You will have either 19 or 20 Republicans in the Senate this yes. time, depending upon the outcome have 20. of SD10. Why have. should the 11 Democrats even come to work? They can't do anything on their own. They can't prevent anything on their own. If you take the thing down from 21 to 19, why would the 11 even bother participating? Um, because they have a lot to contribute. They have a lot of good ideas. Um, and, and let me give you an example of this. Uh, uh, when we crafted our education policy, uh, everything we did in terms of an education, or almost everything we did, helped more constituents in Democrat districts and didn't Republican districts. My focus is I want every child to live the American dream. That's why I want to cut our dropout rate. I want students to, to graduate from high school. I want them to go either get a work certificate, a two-year degree, or a four-year degree. Um, most of the things we do, or many things we do, are not partisan, Evan. What's happened to the two-thirds rule, quite frankly, is that it was designed when we basically had all Democrat senators, or you know, 28 out of 31, or the vast majority. And they had to figure a way as a party to decide who gets to bring their bill to the yeah. floor. I mean, it's really a one-party rule. And, and I think in the last couple of years, the reason we've had so many sessions is I think the Democrats, and uh, look, I understand being, if, they, if I were in the minority, I would do everything I could to protect my position as a senator, but they have blocked so many bills, we've forced these special sessions where we don't use the 21 vote rule. Bottom, bottom line is you will work with the Democrats. I have a great record of working with the Democrats. Um, I think this session, I could be wrong, um, and I'm sure my opponent will correct me if I am, I don't think she cast a no vote in education committee. She may have cast a few right. present not voting, but if, if she cast one or two, I don't think Royce Westermark, I don't think Eddie Lucio, I asked, by the way, right. there's a great point, I asked for Eddie Lucio, a Democrat, to be my vice chair on education. I thought it was important that we had bipartisanship yep. on education. So I have no problem working with Democrats. Good. Okay, well, well, let's ask Senator Vanderpute here in a second. Our time is up. I'm sorry it's only been 30 minutes, but since you it's like sitting great. down with me, let's do it again. We'll do it again. Thank okay, you, sir. Senator Dan Appreciate Patrick, thank, thank you very much, sir. Good thank see you, you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Senator State, uh, State Senator Leticia Vanderpute, Democratic nominee for Lieutenant Governor. Unlike Senator Patrick, she was unopposed in her party's March primary. Like Senator Patrick, she is running for statewide office for the first time. First chosen to represent Senate District 26 in a 1999 special election, she previously served five terms in the Texas House. In the 83rd session, she chaired the Senate Veterans Affairs and Military Installations Committee, served on the Business and Commerce, State Affairs, and Education Committees. A native of San Antonio, she has an undergraduate degree from the University of Texas at Austin and has been a practicing pharmacist since 1980. Please join me in welcoming State Senator Leticia Vanderpeer. How are you? <laughs> Thank you Hi. for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Morning. Hi. <laughs> Good morning to you. Good morning. Tried to keep him on stage. Sorry. I would have loved the original plan, which was for both of us to have a great conversation he, with he you. He wriggled off the stage. I couldn't do it. But. Uh, Senator, for all the talk that this was going to be the real marquee battle, of the campaign. It's been a bit of a nothing burger race. You've done your thing. He's done his thing. There hasn't been very much interaction, as we said. The polls, at least the polls that we've seen, have set up pretty much as the polls have for the last 20 years. What do you think is going on here? Give us the, the narrative of the arc of this race as you see it. I think that in the race for lieutenant governor, and rightly so, uh, the people in this room, uh, Woodstock for wonks or 
ACL for Nerds, uh, yeah. we know that this position and this responsibility is a great one. Yeah. But we saw an extended Republican primary with four candidates and then a runoff. They had over 20 public forums and debates. In this case, uh, when uh, my opponent, my colleague, Dan Patrick, secured the nomination, we didn't hear from him for five weeks. Uh, canceled appointments, uh, did not come to industry or trade show uh, association well, You heard him just say he's done 1,300 meetings with people all over the state. Well, if he's meeting privately, he never makes his schedule uh, public. Uh, just had his first press conference since the day he won. The, yeah. uh, so I would love for the people of this state, right. the voters, to be able to question both of the candidates on the issues. Senator, you're a very smart politician. You've been at this a long time. If you were winning or believed you were winning, and you knew that by not being out in public as much as your opponent might like, yes. you would just basically win the race. You'd do the same thing, wouldn't you? I would respect the voters. I mean, this is an important and a very, very much a, a, a position in the legislative branch, both by the powers in the Constitution, but by the rules of the Senate. Yeah. And if voters can't depend on their leaders, to be accessible and to be accountable to them before they're elected, yeah. what type of behavior is that gonna instill once they're already elected? The, the theory of this race, the dominant theory of this race, and it goes back to before he yeah. won the nomination, when Democrats were saying, oh, we hope we get Dan Patrick to run against, is that some kind of precipitating event would occur. Clady wouldn't shake Hans' hand, right? Yeah. And that Senator Patrick would blow himself up and that ultimately you would be the beneficiary. It's not happening. It shows no sign of happening. Well, he hadn't been out anywhere. Right, well, but that's the point, right? Um, no opportunity for that. You, you know Senator Patrick. You know yes. Senator Patrick. Yeah. You've worked with him in the last seven years. Do you think he's qualified or fit temperamentally to be lieutenant governor? I mean, I was afraid you'd go there. Well, I'm just asking because, you know, look, I, I could very well ask the same question of him about you. The, we want to know whether the people who are running for office are fit to be lieutenant governor. Do you believe he's fit to be lieutenant governor? I know that I am. I have But I didn't ask been, you that. Uh, I asked you whether I, he's fit to be lieutenant governor. And maybe it's because I've had 34 years uh, wearing a white jacket across a prescription counter and a small business owner and right. mom and grandmother and, and a legislator for 21 years. Um, I have the greatest respect for Dan Patrick um, in his past history and in him being elected to the legislature. That's what representative democracy is about. It's about people who engage their right to vote to select the candidate of their choice. So it's going to be up to the voters to make that determination, it, not it, you. It will be up to the voters. Now, Dan sits in front of me, and he is a great radio talk show host. He stays on message, as you can see by this morning, kind of evading your questions and answering exactly what he wanted to convey. He is great uh, at that, and he sits in front of me. And yes, we've worked together. But the thing is that I've always worked with everyone. The entire time I've been in the Senate, it's been a Republican control. And so the Senate. fact is, if he were elected and you were to lose this race and go back to the state Senate, you would work closely with him, you would have no problem with it. I work with everyone. Work with and everyone. I would work with the presiding right. officer as I have with, with every, every single, every single time. session. Yes. In the absence of some kind of disqualifier, Senator, you have to win this on the issues. And so let's talk about the issues that you've put forward. You have put forward, to your credit, very specific policy proposals on all the big issues. Begin on public education. I'm just summarizing some of the planks that you've put forward. Full day pre-K, correct? Full day pre-K for those, all of those students who are qualified. Who are qualified. Smaller classes, which I interpret to mean more teachers. Reinstating some of the funding that was lost in 2011. Absolutely. 11,000 teachers lost their jobs, right. and we had over 8,000 class right. size waivers. Both those things, full day pre-K, and especially reinstating more of the public ed cuts from 2011, have a cost associated with them. Where are you gonna get the money from? This was not a spendy legislature before, and looking at the likely election returns in the legislature this time, it's likely to be a less spendy legislature this time. So where's the money gonna come from? I know that Texans value investment. If they didn't, they wouldn't have voted for $2 billion in the constitutional amendment 
on our water projects last November. I'm hoping that Texans will come to the polls again this November and vote for that allocation right. of the transportation. But you understand that public education dollars, uh, Senator Van Peter, are yes. not in isolation. It's not public ed versus not public ed. It's yes. public ed in competition for other things. Absolutely. So will the voters want you to put public ed first among the priorities? When I visit the Rio Grande Valley, when I visit the Panhandle, when I visit the Metroplex, Houston, El Paso, yeah. and East Texas, they talk about education. And it's parents, it's students, it's business owners, because they understand that for us to continue to be successful, it's right. about a qualified workplace. Pre-kinder, that program was 200 million, got ripped yep. in the 2011 budget. We only replaced 30 million. We're gonna have a surplus, and I say surplus because their uh, comptroller really estimated very, very conservatively, right. probably about five billion when we come in, certainly. So you think you have, an opportunity, you have an opportunity to take advantage of that Absolutely, good our fortune. sales tax right. continues to increase. And, you'd put, and so you'd put that back into public ed? I would put, put that, that back, back into, into public ed, into absolutely. Public ed. It was working before, and we need to absolutely put those programs back on track that were showing success. Right, you, you uh, were part of the effort to reduce standardized testing in the last session from 15 yes. to five, but you're now advocating for it to go from five to one. That's correct. You wanna come back around. If we're gonna spend all this additional money on public education, wouldn't it be good to know whether it's working? Why would we reduce accountability down from five to one um, when we wanna be sure that these additional dollars we put into the system are actually paying benefits? What I have proposed is to get the high stakes testing off the backs of our students. Now this is high stakes testing. Yeah. This is very different from your accountability system. So you think there would still be accountability measures adequate That's to the right. task in this case? There would be. We do yeah. not use statistical sampling. Right. Other tests nationwide do use statistical so that not every single child, every single year, would yeah. have to take this high stakes exam so that we could return teachers to their primary job of teaching the curriculum. When you spend almost three weeks yeah. in uh, trying to practice the test, and they used to call them benchmarks, now they have another name, and bubble in, or 26 lines in a written exam that right. you hire the graders off a of Craigslist, it's not meeting the needs of our accountability system, it's yeah. not meeting the needs of employers, and it is destroying the love of learning in our classrooms. What I'm saying is get rid of the high stakes testing, but the accountability, we could do that because we absolutely need to measure on a campus level right. and district level how our schools are performing. Higher ed, I'm interested to see a number of things in your proposal. You're advocating for excellence at public universities. Who could argue with that? Community colleges are a big focus of your higher ed plan. Specifically, you want to take $2 billion out of the Rainy Day Fund to subsidize community college for anybody who wants it. My understanding of the Rainy Day Fund is surely not as precise as yours, but these are one-time, there's probably one-time withdrawals. Yes. By what definition would funding a community college subsidy qualify as, as pr proper to withdraw from the Rainy Day Fund? How, how does that work? Well, first of all, Evan, it's not a subsidy. It's an investment. Well, it's, that's, that's it's semantics. You know no, what it is. No. You're paying for it's everybody to go to community college. It's an investment. Yeah. Our Rainy Day Fund, even with the withdrawal of the water, even yeah. with the withdrawal of uh, transportation, will probably be sitting at about $8.4 billion. So the money will be there. And because all economists have told us we are in a golden age of oil and gas, that rainy day fund, economic stabilization fund, as it's technically called, will constantly be replenished. Yep. I am calling for the Texas Promise Plan. And what we call it is a promesa, right? The promise. You could take a one-time allocation of $2 billion, take it to the voters. That corpus of that fund would remain. And then the proceeds from that could fund every qualified yeah. high school graduate for two years of community college or that technical program, right. that certification program. A one-time investment could change a generation. You would need two-thirds of the House members and two-thirds of the members of the Senate to support this, and they would have to yeah. go to the voters. Could you get two-thirds of the House and Senate to do this? Look how hard it was to get them to support the other stuff. If we approached every legislative session with it's going to be too hard, yeah then our state is not going to be So are you successful. saying that the votes are there, or are you saying, I don't care whether the votes are there, we have to try? 
We have to try yeah. because we know that 55% of the jobs in 2020 will require a post high school something. That means a technical program, a licensure, a certification, an associate's degree, or a four-year institution the, of, of, of a college diploma. Yeah. We know that. We would be the envy of the nation. We would have a workforce that is diverse, that's young, and well-educated. Yeah. And we know your good friend, Dr. Murdoch, has already told us we've got to get those students to and through our public school system and then make sure they're ready for the next step. Yeah. This is an investment, and I know Texans value investment, and they'll do almost anything if they think it's gonna improve the lives of their kids or their grandkids. Let me, let me go to immigration quickly, uh, uh, Senator. We talked about immigration with Senator Patrick, yeah. and he offered his perspective on the things that he's uh, supported in the past and would support again as Lieutenant Governor. He has said about you that you're for amnesty. True or false? False. Explain where you come down on the question of comprehensive immigration reform then. Just like many people, I am so frustrated and at times angry at Washington, D.C. It seems like both sides of uh, the party, either party, is more interested in making the other side look bad yeah. than they are really focusing on what's needed. And the definition of amnesty for me uh, and the definition of amnesty certainly for my opponent are very different. No amnesty means everybody gets a free ride. Everybody automatically, those who are already here, automatic. Yeah. That's not what this is. They need to have a pathway. They need to pay taxes, not have a criminal record, right. be proficient in English. I think it is very important for uh, everyone who is here in the United States to have that English language proficiency. Yeah. And they need to get in line. But to say to the 11 million people who yeah. have been here, like, the mother of the person, Elsa, that I met in the Rio Grande Valley. Her mom had been here 17 years. She got caught making a right-hand turn from a bike lane. Now her children, her husband, right. they're without her. We have got to have a more sensible way. What, what, so it, my thing would yeah. be, yes, let's do this, but do this in a manner that's respectful of the hard work of the immigrants who have been here, who have not yeah. had any criminal element. Why, why did your president, our president, Senator, our president, but the president from your party, punt on immigration reform till past the election? Why did he do that? If I knew what every single president, what every single governor did you think for it's a, You think it's a good decision to wait until after the election? I, I'm not gonna delve on whether it's a good one. He thought it was. And I believe that there are probably folks in the country who thought it was. But if we keep punting, we're never going to get anywhere. And the folks, particularly on the Rio Grande Valley, uh, in our border areas, are paying the price. Because yeah. until then, you're going to have people like Dan Patrick and others who use the politics of fear and use toxic rhetoric to just to get votes. So you're, and yeah, so you're, yes. you're, you're, in that, you're in the camp that says that Senator Patrick and others Talk about the valley in a way that ultimately hurts the valley, hurts business in the valley, hurts the image of the valley. It's not only me that's saying that, Evan. It is the valley leaders themselves. I'm so glad that Dan finally got to the Rio Grande Valley. He hadn't even been south of I-10 before the primary runoff. And, you know, maybe it's because I'm a sixth-generation Texan. And my family, the San Miguel family, was in Maverick County. And we know that 300-year history. We know that those leaders, business leaders, law enforcement, uh, local elected officials, yep. have told us that the very harsh rhetoric and the tones that have been taken are hurting their ability to attract jobs. Yep. And they have got a growing UTRGV, SpaceX, the superhighway that's coming from Mazatlan to FAR, bringing with it so much economic opportunity. And then you got people that are so disrespectful of the people who live on the border that they will say anything to get a vote, even if it harms the very people that they supposedly want to represent as lieutenant governor. Let me, um, let me move on because we're in kind of, you know, kind of high speed mode here with the 30 minutes, I'm, I'm sorry to say. We've got to move on to taxes. The, it has become standard practice for journalists to ask Democratic candidates for statewide office every four years, are you willing to consider a tax increase during a legislative session if you're elected, or will you take tax increases off the table? When you say tax increases, it could be margins tax, sales tax, and uh, 
certainly uh, oil and gas taxes. Well, why don't you tell me, the, so, we well, can go quickly, tell me the taxes you're willing to raise. How about that? Well, I think I'm willing to have members of the legislature, both House and Senate, yeah. look at the budget and what do we need of priorities? What are our priorities? And focus and get a budget out that meets the needs of our state's priorities. So, so you will not take taxes, raise, raising taxes off the table, per se? I don't think in the current economic climate that we're in, we've got increased sales tax. We're going to have a great rainy day fund. So you don't think it'll be necessary? I don't think that it'll be necessary to even look at an income tax. I yeah. don't think it'll be necessary uh, to look at how would we bring in revenue. Now, certainly, the margins tax is not working. Uh, we know the House had a more comprehensive view last summer, yeah. even though most people last summer would think it was all about women's health. The reason the legislature stayed so long is because of the transportation component. Right. And the House had a much more in-depth, more of a cafeteria-style menu. I think we need to look, because even if we approve these funds in November, and the voters say yes, it's really only a well, fourth of what well, we need to get there. And, and, and so to, and to that, how, how yeah. do we do that? So there may be uh, motor vehicle uh, registration fees. There may be ways that we can partner with local government. Right allow local government to be able to assess what they need. Because when we talk about roads and bridges, it's yeah. not just state. Uh, you know, you can beat your chest all you want and say, oh yeah, we cut taxes. No, we didn't. We just put it on to the local Everything leaders. rolled, everything Absolutely. rolled down. Absolutely. I, I hope I haven't gotten this wrong. I read the editorial page this morning at about 5 a.m., but I believe it was your own hometown paper, The Express News, that editorialized in favor of an increase in the gas tax. Do you support that? I think we need to look at indexing that gas tax. but. Our motor fuels tax is a dwindling type of tax. Why? Because of the efficiency, efficiency of, of, cars. of our cars. Right. So I wouldn't put everything into a motor fuels tax that hopefully will continue to decrease. I mean, we should be right. so happy for the motor fuel efficiency, electric cars and natural gas cars. And, and so I think we really need to take a comprehensive yeah. look. But I was in the legislature the last time we did anything on motor fuels tax. So that's, it's a long time, long time ago. Um, yes. Senator Patrick said, kind of matter of factly, she's for Medicaid expansion. She would expand Obamacare. Is that a fair characterization of your position? Well, first of all, I think that, again, that use of the rhetoric, I mean, the terminology Obamacare. Well, let's just right? call it Vandepute Care. Take uh, the name no. off the table. But, but you Take know what it is? Take the name off the table. Do you know what it is? It's do people in this country and in this state. Yeah believe that every American family ought to have a family doctor. That's what this is. And it is, for me, a very bad business decision to not work with the federal government to return those dollars right. that we're all paying in IRS taxes back to Texas and figure out a Texas solution. He, he and others say that the Medicaid system is broken, and so to buy into an expansion of Medicaid would be to buy into something that's not working, and that would actually not be good for Texas. It would be great for Texas. And you know why? Because every economist has said, if we draw down those federal dollars, right. that's 200,000 jobs. That's $2 billion there's jo there's in There's job service. creation, actually. There's right. job creation. Yep. Plus, we're penalizing about 85% of Texans live in communities that have a hospital district. The state isn't in charge of indigent care. It's yeah. the counties. So our taxpayers are getting hit twice. Let's respect yeah. them. They're paying IRS taxes that are going for health services in other states, yeah. and they're paying property taxes to hospital districts we, at, at the tune of $2.3 billion. And my goodness, other conservative states with conservative governors, nobody's ever called Jan Brewer a liberal, found a way to bring back those dollars to their state. We could and we could continue. When they right. say the Medicaid system is broken, yeah. I ask my colleagues, now, nah, what is that? Well, it's because we don't have enough physicians. We don't have enough physicians because of the reimbursement rates. The federal government does not uh, cut those contracts with the insurance companies. That's Texas Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, we know that physicians want to be able to see the population. My daughter is an OBGYN. Yeah, yeah. But they can't continue to have that type of uncompensated care, and particularly when the Medicaid rates are so low. Yep. So let's look at bringing those back and make sure that we have value, yep. that we have the rates that are going to have our physicians be able to take care of our families. Let me move from healthcare broadly to women's health, a topic that has been much in evidence on the campaign trail. Last week, 
a Hidalgo County clinic disassociated itself with Planned Parenthood so it could reclaim state dollars for women's health. You probably saw this story. Yes. The, the, somebody from the clinic said uh, it was a practical decision to help and serve women in our area. It allowed there to be a clinic that was, uh, that was open that otherwise would not have had the funding to be available. That's Do you correct. agree with that decision? Is Planned Parenthood the issue here that maybe if, if other clinics around the state were to say we're going to run independent of Planned Parenthood, that possibly some of the problems that you've seen over the last year on women's health would be eliminated? In the past few years, we have seen certainly that attack on the types of providers that women absolutely need. Yep. But it wasn't just Planned Parenthood. When the legislature, and certainly my opponent was part of that group, cut the funding for the women's health program, a $1 Texas dollar draws down nine from the federal. But they did that because they wanted to get to Planned Parenthood. They didn't care who was in the crosshairs. Even hundreds of thousands of women who lost the only well woman's check they would have, rural women, yep. and women all over, they didn't care, right? That the Valley needs to do what it needs to do. So you, su you support this clinic's decision or their I right to make the decision absolutely. to keep the clinic I open? I support local leaders right. who are desperate to make sure that women just able to get the health services that have been ripped from them because of policy decisions made by this legislature. What happens, what happens to the legislature or in the legislature next time should um, uh, Senator Patrick get elected lieutenant governor? You're going to have 19 or 20 Republican senators. Are we likely to see more action on women's health? I mean, I suppose the legislature could vote to ban abortion at 20 minutes. I mean, it's still more than they could conceivably do, right? 20 weeks is where we stand right now. We've seen the legislation that's working its way through the courts. But like, what, you know, what, what are you anticipating could happen? What, what's, what's on the table, do you think, if your opponent is elected? The women that I meet all over this state, the healthcare providers that I listen to all over this state are extremely concerned of what would happen to women's health care, given Dan Patrick's history on this. So you think there's, you, you think there's likely to be more action on this if, uh, if your opponent is elected? I don't know. I don't know what motivates Dan Patrick. I, I really don't know. Uh, at times, uh, and particularly with issues to women's health. Yep. But what I'm saying is we've got to get to a place in this state where women are respected and they're valued and they're perfectly capable of making their own decisions about the most personal things in their private lives. We have about four, Senator, about four minutes left. I want to move to the politics of this race. Voter turnout has been a problem for your party for some time. No Democrat elected statewide in 20 years, in large part because you haven't been able to turn out enough voters to elect a Democratic candidate. The Latino community is always a focus for Democrats. How do we turn the Latino community out? Why has it been so difficult? Why has it been such a conundrum? Why are Latinos who clearly have a stake in the future of this race, seemingly, according to the statistics on turnout, less willing to turn out to vote in November than African Americans or Anglo? Evan, I think people have been asking this question for a very long time. Yeah. Uh, what I do know is that Latinos care about their family, and they care about their children. And I know that because I've always, I mean, I, I, I live a block and a half from where I grew up, and I still practice pharmacy um, in the barrio, in, in San Antonio. And I know that they will do what it takes for their children. I'm except, you, apparent, except apparently vote. I mean, this well, is the business I know the that problem. my community, my community has a very high pain threshold. Yeah. There's a beautiful part of the culture that aguantamos. What that means is, boy, do we are we are proud of endurance and the stuff that happens. And I know that hundreds of millions of dollars have been used to try to convince non-Latinos to vote. We have never had a sustained effort on media, uh, on Spanish language media, that encourages, and yet we do know that Latinos will turn out in numbers. It happened in Colorado, it yeah. happened in Nevada. We've never had that type of so effort. So who should be putting that effort, who should be putting the effort in place? I think the candidates are putting that effort. Yeah. I think Texas Democratic Party is putting that ba effort. Battleground putting it in place. Battleground is yeah. doing a fabulous job, and we've got, groups that are top in Houston, act in the valley, that are really trusted 
in their own communities, and they are knocking on doors, yep. and they are making those phone calls. Can you win this election if the Latino vote is roughly the same percentage as it was in the last election? No. But I think that what I see in Latino communities, because they say Leticia, right? Well, Van de Pute is not a Latino name. Dutch? Yeah. yeah. But if I was in Belgium, it would be like right. a Smith or a Garcia. Well, I, but I mean, I, 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 I've, noticed, I've noticed that you're using the San Miguel. I've never seen you use the San yeah. Miguel before. So you're having to remind people that you're Latino. I, I'm very proud to be Leticia Rosa Magdalena San Miguel Van Van de Pute. Right, yeah. But that's a little long for a bumper sticker. It is. I like LVDP. I just think that actually works. Um, uh, let but me, they're let me, very yeah. proud. Let me they ask you very proud one, one or of the two fact more. This would be historic. One election. or two more questions about yeah. about the state of this race. The polls are showing, and we don't really have independent polls at this point. Not truly independent polls, but they're showing the race at sort of 15 to 20 points. You behind uh, Senator Patrick. Uh, Senator Davis's campaign leaked a poll last week that showed her only eight down. Do you want to leak a poll to me right now? Do you have polls that show this race closer? Well, number one, if I had a poll, I wouldn't leak it. Uh, but we've just begun, uh, we're hitting our targets on fundraising, but right. we've just begun uh, our media, our commercials are up in Houston, San Antonio, in the right. Valley. Uh, and I think, uh, given the fact that there was almost a year and a half now of running on the Republican side, uh, my opponent has spent millions of dollars, yep. and, and by the way, he's about in debt for it, it, that we will now have the opportunity to take our message. I mean, who is Leticia, right? right. Who, who is Leticia, and what does she stand for? I think when they understand that I will fight, number one, for education, yep. uh, that opportunity for our children to take care of the priorities of this state, and that uh, basically I will fight and bring people together, fight for what is right for our state and put Texas first. Do you think you have I, time I, still I, to build adequate name ID and to get the message out? It's only 45 days till the election. The momentum is there. Uh, I am very excited at what we're seeing. And particularly, it's not just the Latino vote. I'm having a significant amount of Republican crossover on this. Great business leaders are hosting fundraisers yeah. for us. And uh, very conservative communities uh, are, are, are coming together because they know the difference between a frivolous expense and an investment. And they know the difference between somebody who's got a track record, a proven track record, of working with everyone. Yeah. Uh, to keep us on track, not a my way or the highway, bullying, intimidation type right. uh, of governance, but somebody who is respectful and can bring people together. Senator, uh, good luck on the rest of the campaign trail. Thank, Thank you. you so much for the Thank time. You, okay, Thank you, Evan. Okay, very good. Senator Leticia Dadzik. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Good. Good. good to see you. Thank you. Thank good. you so much. Thank you. We'll be back in a few minutes with Ross Ramsey and Joe Strauss. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Good, ma'am. Thank you very much.